Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all, and welcome to this GLF Live. My name is Peter Umune, and I will be your host and moderator in today's conversation. I am the Senior Environmental Specialist at the Global Environment Facility, the GF, where I lead and coordinate agriculture and food system programs. Today's discussion will focus on collective, our collective efforts to transform our food systems. Specifically, how we reduce environmental degradation and negative externalities associated with uh, food system spanning across the entire value chains from farm to plate. But today's uh, discussion is also taking place after several events on food system and conservation agenda. Let me highlight only two of them. The first one is the seventh assembly of the GLF, of the GEF, where environmental leaders from 185 countries gathered in Vancouver to discuss ways to tackle climate and biodiversity crisis and to promote inclusive conservation. During the GEF assembly, side events and the round table on pathways toward food system transformation were organized. Ministers, experts from the UN agencies, international organizations, research centers, civil society, private sector, all share the stories and good practices capturing the journey in implementing and supporting food system transformation activities at a different scale. The other event that took place prior to the GEF Assembly is the UN Food System Summit, where leaders of the world gathered in Rome, not only to take stock of major outcomes since the launch by the UN Secretary General of the UN Food System Summit in 2021, but also to lay out strategies and the means for implementation to achieve impact in the coming years. From these events and many others, there were so many lessons, but also key takeaways that will be uh, that will be shared today. And wh what they mean for ecosystem protection globally. So we are very lucky today, uh, taking part to this discussion. Uh, we are joined by uh, Maria Elena Semedo who is the, di the, di the director general who is the deputy director general at FAO. she is an economist and a political in progress where she was the first ever woman minister a leading expert in global development issues she has worked in public service over 30 years helping shape a new global narrative where agri-food system transformation is prominently recognized as a solution to tackle today's challenges, from climate change to biodiversity loss to achieve food security. Semedo promotes cross-sectoral engagement and strong strategic partnerships to best support FAO members to reach the SDGs. A great advocate for women's empowerment, she's the chair of the first ever FAO Women's Committee. Semedo also serves as FAO representative in Niger and the deputy regional representative for Africa and sub regional coordinator for West Africa. Maria, welcome. Joining us also is Justina Puri, who's the associate vice president for strategy and the knowledge department at IFAD. She leads the organization's strategic work in IFAD's key areas targeting agriculture, climate, gender, nutrition, youth, and the social inclusion. Puri provides a vision for evidence informed advice on program design and implementation, contributing to resource mobilization and supporting IFAD's global remit in providing state of the art policy advice related to this topic. Kuri has worked previously in many organizations, 
including the Green Climate Fund, the three IA, UNEP, the World Bank, and the UNDP. Huri is also an adjunct associate professor at Columbia University in New York. She has published in many academic journals and written for newspapers and provided advice as a board member to several development organizations. In 2019, Huri was selected as one of the 16 women who have shown leadership in restoring the health through the effort by the Global Landscape Forum, which she has. She holds a PhD and a master's in agriculture and resource economics and a master in development economics. Joe, welcome. Last but not least, Christopher Brett. Chris leads the food system, land use, and the restoration known as Follow Impact Program at the World Bank. And he has over 30 years of experience working with, within the public and the private sectors in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Brit serves as the World Bank representative on the Ag Result Steering Committee, providing technical inputs and the guidance to the design monitoring and the evaluation of the challenge projects. He has a master's degree in agricultural development from Cranfield University. Chris, welcome. So let's just dive into the conversation. <clears throat> I know um, you all were in the uh, Jeff 7th Assembly in Vancouver, and you participated in many discussions, side events, round tables, and so on. And during that assembly, there were also some very key moments and event on the food system. So the question that I have for all of you, if you can just take a moment to give us your primary takeaway from the Jeff assembly, especially for food system. And feel free to give a quick introduction about your organization and what you are doing before you dive into the, into the, the, the question or the, the response that you will provide. Let me start with you, Maria Elena. The floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Peter, and good afternoon to all. I am uh, Deputy Director General, as Peter referred to the Food and Agriculture Organization. You can see how important for the Food and Agriculture Organization the transformation of agri-food systems is at the center of our work and our debate nowadays in FAO. But what impressed me or what was my takeaway? First, Peter, you know, this Jeff, in Jeff Sermon, uh, we start already with the impact program on food system. To me, it was that Jeff with the partners has been a visionary even before the Food System Summit, on the importance of the food system. And what uh, and why food system? Because we know that the world is facing hunger. We have more than 700 people that doesn't go to bed with three meals. We know that the way we are produced is not sustainable. And we have the climate change, the biodiversity loss, and other crises affecting us. All of these bring to environment degradation and how we can produce in a way that we can feed the world, we can preserve and conserve biodiversity, and we can help to fight to, to climate change. And I think it was clear by everyone that the food system approach this integrated and cross-sectoral approach is the solution for produce better, have a nutritious food, and at the same time, preserve the environment. This is my first takeaway. Second, that the food system agenda is not an FAO agenda, is not an IFAD agenda, is a global agenda. As you mentioned, for the leaders, for the farmers, for the science, for innovation, for the financial institution, that we need to, to work all together across the borders. And no one can be left alone or left aside uh, in this process. And the third one maybe is how the farmers, they embrace 
uh, this approach. We could see in the um, different events, in the different conversation, in the booths, how the farmers, they were saying that having this approach, they were able, even during COVID, we had an example in the FAO booth, how during COVID they were able to have solutions. The one it was to export banana, they couldn't export, but they start with the value chain approach to prepare to prepare banana chips. They were able to improve and to increase their benefits, their livelihoods, and to empower women through the approach. Maybe my last takeaway, take away and I finish. It was the importance given to women, to youth and indigenous people in the debates that they are part of, of the solution and they have to come up with approaches and responses. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for these uh, four takeaways. Um, let's now turn on to Joe. Um, Joe, the floor is yours. Give us some takeaways. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you really very much for having me here. Um, I was privileged, like Maria Elena, to be part of the um, um, part of the participants in the engagers in Vancouver and at the Seventh Jeff Assembly. So a few things that came out for me really startlingly, uh, which were perhaps a little bit different from previous conversations, was. Um, First, um, there was uh, the Global Biodiversity Fund that was essentially ratified by and started off by the entire membership and by the Jeff Council, which was really exciting because it really highlighted also for IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the importance of biodiversity in the overall global dialogue, but primarily also for us in the operational work that we do. So that's one. I think the second part was the integrated agenda. I think the recognition across the different discussions that we were having of the fact that biodiversity by itself cannot be achieved unless we are looking at biodiversity as a lens through which food systems must be uh, dealt with so that they are sustainable on the malnutrition and the undernourishment. Uh, that we are experiencing in the world today was the second. I think the third part that came out quite strongly was financing. So there were several very high level commitments that were made to the Global Biodiversity Fund at Vancouver. And what this really highlighted was the importance that we have to, as international public agencies, uh, pay to uh, really focusing on putting our mouths where uh, putting our money where our mouths are and i think the commitments that were coming through in terms of really com um, in terms of biodiversity was clearly important um, i think um, the importance that we have seen um, uh, of biodiversity linked and biodiversity based uh, investments are clear but with that as an international financing institution, what was also very clear in the sidelines of the discussion was that it's really important to build that pipeline of projects that can absorb this um, financing uh, so that it is linked both to food systems on one side, but is also linked to ensuring that we have nature-based solutions integrated. And my last point really, Peter, that came out really strongly, and I'm hoping that I'll have a chance to discuss this a little bit more, is that uh, the fact that if we really want to get to biodiversity as one of the key pillars of our overall development agenda, we've got to look at smallholder farmers. In a publication that we just brought out, which is a rapid evidence assessment, my co-authors and I looked at what the evidence is with respect to biodiversity content of small-scale farmers versus large-scale production. And we find very strong evidence that small-scale producers and small-scale farms and small-scale plots are far more likely to integrate biodiversity into them as part of the production methods than large-scale monocultural farms. And that by 
recognizing this important attribute and the attribute that small scale farms are also responsible for feeding 75% of the globe's population really gives us a very strong way forward uh, in terms of both securing food systems resilience as well as ensuring the overall global resilience of planet Earth by looking at biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, thank you for your takeaways. Um, let's now turn uh, to uh, Chris Brett. Chris from the World Bank. Um, your takeaways. Over. No, no, thank you very much, Peter. And, and really, really building on, of course, the great comments of uh, Maria Helena and, and Joe, uh, who I had the great privilege to spend quite some time with in Vancouver. <laughs> I, I found the whole uh, session in Vancouver absolutely fascinating. Uh, I mean, for me, it very strongly built out the whole concept of partnership, partnership, partnership. And I'm very proud to say, you know, here at the World Bank with the global knowledge platform of FOLOR that you introduced, Peter, that, that the World Bank is leading on. Um, you know, we have built strong partnerships with FAO, with GLF, who's hosting us, you know, with WBCSD, IFC, uh, UNDP, and, you know, huge partnerships, you know, formed there across a global level, but also very importantly, with the work that we're doing with the Jeff um, Seven, really getting down into these 27 countries, which are part of the uh, FOLOR network. And as you, as many of the audience know, we've talked about FOLOR before, but just as a bit of a reminder, our focus is on eight commodities in 27 countries. And the eight commodities are really being very focused on bad issues related to deforestation, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, and when we look now at those eight commodities and the work we're doing with the support of the partnerships is really a question now how those commodities can be at the forefront of rebuilding these environmental and biodiversity systems. And I'm really pleased to sort of say my key takeaway really was that, that before Jeff 7, we had Jeff 6. Jeff 6 really built a solid platform and a lot of knowledge and a lot of areas around biodiversity, commodities, et cetera. Then we move into Jeff 7, which, of course, we're working on at the moment. I just briefed you on. <clears throat> but importantly, with Jeff, we've got Jeff 8 coming along, the Food Systems Integrated Program, which is being run uh, mainly by uh, well, by FAO and IFAT. And I, I just think this continuity that Jeff brings and Jeff 8 looking at sustainable agriculture, sustainable aquaculture, sustainable livestock, these are all aspects that we build upon. And instead of these programs, you know, only doing five years, six years, Jeff's created a lot of history, a lot of investment, a lot of foundation. And the new fund that we're talking about here uh, as well, we'll mention more of the, um, the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund is really going to build a great deal of opportunity to lead more finance. So my key takeaway is a tremendous amount of interest in the food system. Um, everyone really appreciating the food system is tremendously complex and has to be dealt with in many, many different ways. Um, I think also, you know, when it comes to the World Bank and we come into these FOLOR programs, we're bringing a lot of knowledge from all the different parts of the bank, the public part of the bank, the private part of the um, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, that's also a partner in the FOLOR. So it gives us opportunity to leverage multiple investment points. Um, you know, my final takeaway to you is that that at the World Bank, with the food crisis we've had, um, you know, coming out of the Ukraine and the Russia crisis, really led to a lot of disruption of supply chains, basic supply chains of food and so on. We've all been mobilizing finance, but we now are really getting to the point is let's put this finance in the real right place. Let's look at the short term issues, but obviously, very importantly, the long term issues. And I think with a lot of the guidance that Jeff has been coming forward and your longer term investments, you know, we've got all these emergency funds happening, but Jeff keeps us on a very solid long term pathway of sustainable development, you know, across multiple areas. And of course, that's acknowledging the role of youth, indigenous communities, gender, and also mobilizing private capital around these um, programs we build and creating, as Joe put it, you know, massive opportunities for smallholders. Um, you know, my last point is that a few years ago, I commissioned some work with WBS, WB, WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And what was shocking at that time, we have all these 500 odd million smallholders, but only about 11% of the smallholders were actually integrated into markets. 
you know, and that's a big weakness. You know, the integration into markets creates the opportunity for finance, it creates the opportunity for technology transfer, the increased digitization, and that's changing, but it's a strong area that I work on. So let me stop there, Peter, and look forward to the next question. Back to you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris, and thank you very much to all. I think there are quite so many uh, key takeaways um, from the integrated approach, from a global movement as a, for, for, for food system, uh, for the, the, the Global Biodiversity Fund that was ratified, um, from financing that was basically the need uh, to scale up our approaches, but also the partnership that you're talking about and the role of smallholders when it comes to transforming food system, but also women, youth and marginalized people and the role in transforming the food system. So let's now move on to the second question that is very much interesting. As I said, uh, there were two big events. So there was the UN Food System um, uh, Summit in Rome, and then now the Jeff Assembly that all put this momentum. Um, and I just want I just want to hear from you um, coming out of from uh, coming from these two big events, uh, the UN Food System in Rome. We had quite a lot of momentum, and then now the the Jeff Assembly. Um, you know, in your own words, how can we really capitalize this momentum coming out of this event um, to drive really sustainability um, in food systems? And let me very much uh, uh, start this question uh, with Chris. You know, Chris, I, I know you you were at the UN Food System Summit um, and you um, you provided quite a, a lot of information in terms of repurposing agriculture subsidies, the three Fs, um, and, and the work that you are doing under the, 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 the finance app with IFAD. Um, what will you tell us in terms of um, capitalizing the momentum to drive sustainability in food systems? Over to no, you. thanks, Peter. I mean, I, I thought the event uh, was quite fascinating. I mean, it was a UN hosted event and very, very privileged and pleased that the World Bank was invited not just to that event, but to, to really participate in some of the key sessions. Uh, just sort of as a high level point, and I'll become a little bit operational in what I'm really thinking, but as a high level point, I mean, we were tasked uh, along with IFAD at the uh, the original Food Systems Summit uh, two years ago in 2021 to, to lead on the food systems architecture around finance. And, and so I'm gonna keep my brief around policy and, and finance because I'm sure that uh, Maria Helena and, and Joe will have other things to say as well. So, so, so just really to say, the, the World Bank has done a tremendous amount of work on the repurposing agenda. And what is repurposing? It, it's looking at really where public money is going into the food system. And, and we see vast amount of money going into you know, subsidies, you know, and subsidies can be effective, but also they can be a concern on short-termism as well. So we've been looking at numbers around about $750 billion a year going into a lot of subsidies related to agricultural inputs, price support, trade distortions, et cetera. And, and we've been really working with governments on trying to analyze their approach to where they're putting their finance. Is their finance going into short-termism, short-term investment? Is it going to economic investment? Is it going to this whole point of long-term sustainability? So Reese, you know, reports that the World Bank has done, you know, in support with IFPRI and others, what we find is that, that lots of governments have been talking strongly about environmental commitments, you know, changing approaches, investing in climate smart agriculture, a whole host of areas of new technologies. But when we look at government spending, you can generalize and say only about four to five percent of all this money that the government is putting into the food system space is actually going into climate change, climate adaption. So, so we're trying to explain in a very fundamental way that, that if we really want to change the food system and the word transformation is used all the time. Transformation means more than 5% investment. You know, we're talking about there's got to be a tipping point of change. So that's one area that I would urge the audience to look at what we're doing in the World Bank. There's a lot of documentation on that. But more importantly, I'm very, very proud um, to have worked with IFAD over the last uh, year, really developing what we call the 3FS tool, which is the financial flows into food systems. And this created a tremendous amount of momentum where we look at food system investment across government. 
you know, when we talk about the government, you know, we, we don't realize we're talking about the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of, of Infrastructure, the Ministry of Industries and so on. So, so we've really built a tool to actually look at where governments are actually spending money. So we call it all like a window one approach where we analyze domestic expenditure you know, within the food system. So we're looking at where money is going into agricultural productivity and support, where money is going into emergency support, food security support, where finance is going into nutrition, where it's going into rural infrastructure and where it's going into adapt, you know, in climate adaption support. And vast amount of money are obviously going into emergency support, very short termism. There's a, quite a lot of funds going into rural infrastructure, but we do see these weaknesses are funds going into nutrition, funds going into, into the climate smart agriculture. We've also worked with um, OECD on the, the numbers of ODA, where foreign overseas money has come into these government systems, supporting those same pillars that I've been talking about. And you start realizing even a lot of the money flowing in from overseas funding development, including the World Bank and so on, this kind of money is still going quite a lot into emergency support, some going into more agricultural productivity, you know, inputs and so on, where you'll, you can argue a lot more economic investment to help those systems. But but coming out of the, the food systems um, summit, you know, number one, repurposing agenda was high, high on the discussion and linking to policy. Number two was governments really wanting to know where their finance, where their money is going, and how they can negotiate with organizations to improve their expenditure. How can they look and rationalize their own budgets? I'd love to speak more, but I better stop, Peter. So um, that's a bit of a two, two areas that were very important to us. I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, and I think we should build on that momentum, uh, the idea of repurposing agricultural subsidies, but also linking that to country policy. So very, very much well taken. Um, let me go back to you, uh, Maria, because I think if you um, hosted this really big event where we have so many people um, and coming and, uh, you know, if has been uh, tasked to lead the coordination hub, but also to implement some of these uh, uh, policies such as the national food system pathways and so on. So, let me just uh, let me just uh, um, ask you um, if you could elaborate a little bit in terms of uh, the momentum that came out of those, uh, you know, the, the UN food system, but also you, what you said in terms of the GF assembly and the food system agenda. And how do you see this momentum taking shape and moving toward uh, uh, sustainability in the food system? Over to you. Thanks. Hey. Thank you. I think since uh, 2021, when we started with the Food System Summit, the world has changed uh, the way it looked at food, the food we produce, the food we consume, and how we transform our food. And when, you know, when we had the, the summit in 2021, and I'm referring because I was discussing with my colleague, we discussed about food, about production, but we are not able to bring environment and climate to the discussion. I think now we have the stock taking, we have Jeff, we have the, food, the SDG Summit. We have been able to connect the dots. That is not to have this integrated approach, but how we are protecting our environment, how we are uh, being climate smart. And now we are able to have this global overview. And this to me, it's how things has, has evolved thanks to all of us, but also thanks to the leaders. Uh, we had this year much more head of states that we had in 2021. All of them talking and embracing this approach that at their country, they need to have this integrated approach. And what Chris said, that is not turning an issue with the Minister of Agriculture. It's the Minister of Agriculture, of Environment, of uh, Minister of Finance, Minister, and also bringing one health approach, the health, health of human, health of animals, and health of our ecosystem. How we can bring this integrated approach at country level and be able to do 
the appropriate financing where is really needed, not only in terms of uh, the, the budget, but how to have a new narrative when we negotiate with the FAD, we negotiate with the World Bank, that we also need to, to have this integrated approach and follow what is coming from the food system. To me, it has been what has been happening. And both us in FAO, even before the food system, we have our strategic framework where we brought the agri-food system transformation. You don't talk only about food system, but the agri-food system that we have agriculture, forestry, fisher, all the sectors all together in the approach and how they can be more resilient, more sustainable, leaving no one behind. Is the inclusivity of the food system. How, as we said, the farmers, the indigenous people, the, the, the youth, the women, they are all together. But just to conclude, let me say, uh, quoting Amina Mohamed, she said, in the food system, we need to bring at the center the ones who produce our food. The centrality of the farmers in the approach, in the decision, it's important. Now, moving forward, I think this integrated approach of the food system was, was discussed in New York, in the, in the SDG Summit, showing that we are not on the path to achieve the SDGs if we continue to work the way we are working and that we need this integrated approach. We need finance, we need scale, and we need leadership. Now we move to COP28. I think it's important that all those messages are brought to COP28, the sustainability, the integration of our food system, but also the summit of the future that we don't lose any moment. And I think Jeff Eight was one of the great moments in this process, that whatever moment we have, next year we have COP of the MCCD. Land and water, they are important. We have this week in FAO, a symposium on soil and water, and we have uh, a meeting, what we call Rome Water Journey, the importance of water and um, water and uh, soils, the way we produce this, the, our food and the uh, integrated approach to water, not only water for agriculture, we consume 70%, but we need water for other use and we need to have a holistic approach. And the soils, the way we have healthy soils that we can have a healthy and sustainable production of our food. Maybe let me stop here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Maria Elena. Uh, I like the points that you said um, that basically um, this event uh, pretty much helped us to connect the dots, right? So now everyone is trying to look into the, the same direction, looking at finance, how to bring this at the scale, leadership, and how we get to this momentum and achieve the SDG. So we'll be looking at the, at the coming COP and the other events that are coming to see whether this momentum will bring us where we are. But again, we're still far, but at least we're making some progress. So let me go to you, uh, Joe. Um, I, I, I know that, um, you know, IFAD has been quite very uh, uh, big investor. In, uh, I've put some investment and a lot of investment to smallholders. Right and also engaging with the private sector. Um, I just want you to uh, reflect on this momentum in that angle of smallholders because you wanted to talk a little bit more about that, uh, but also engaging private sector so that we bring the finance that we need to really support um, uh, uh, sustainability in food systems. Over to you. Thank you so much, Peter. Really, really appreciate that question, primarily also because it speaks to essentially one of the key areas that uh, we think is IFAD's comparative advantage. That is, while we are looking at fragility and while we are looking at climate, really trying to build private sector platforms that can help us to accelerate and to assemble finance from different sources while supporting uh, food systems and supporting smallholder farmers on the ground is really key to our remit. Uh, 
So I, I think whether I, 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 you know, within what Chris and Maria Elena said, one of the uh, first, I, I really want to, um, in that context, go to where Chris started off with, which is the 3FS platform. So the financing for food systems, essentially, as you may have noted, what we have been able to do with that financing platform is to recognize what are the international and national uh, financing flows, including bilateral financing flows coming into countries, and we've set up a mechanism or a methodology for that. But one of the key actors that is missing from that overall methodology is clearly the private sector. And there is where I think there is a huge amount of potential and um, action that is required for public agencies such as us, such as FAUS, such as the World Bank, such as the GEF, to really come and influence the trajectory of the private sector. The World, Bank, uh, the World Benchmarking Alliance, I don't know if you saw the news, also brought out a really key report. And I had the opportunity to review it last year when they brought out the first version. But they look at 350 food and agriculture organizations and they benchmark them according to um, their responsibility and the degree to which these 350 food and agriculture organizations that contribute to that are responsible for half of the overall global revenue generated in the world today from food and agriculture uh, to gauge them according to whether they assess and have frameworks to understand the impact of their work on nature on people's rights and on governance amongst other things and what they find is and this is important because we're having this discussion with respect to biodiversity, that zero organization have a full, full framework to assess the overall impact of their work on nature. This is telling because it is clearly where public agencies such as ourselves need to step in to ensure that it's not just the quantity of money and resources that we are bringing in, but it's also the quality of that money that we need to look at when we are constructing these platforms. And the second aspect of that is really ensuring equity. So I'm currently sitting actually in Nairobi, which is far from you know, where I should be located, which is Rome, primarily because I'm also the co-chair of the International Land Coalition, which brings together more than 300 networks of agencies that are really responsible for ensuring land rights for people on the ground. And that's really important because equity goes to, and I think Chris said this, equity goes to the heart of what can help to ensure the sustainability of food systems today. The third point I wanna make is really with respect to targets. One of the key things and, and measurement and evidence one of the key things that I think we're doing, and you know, FAO and IFAD, is, um, as Maria Elena noted as well, we are partners in essentially taking forward the overall food systems uh, integrated program for the GEF, as you know, Peter. And I think one of the key things I want to bring in, but also ensure that there is good evidence and good data that built into these frameworks so that we can truly understand what is the impact on the ground. Right now, through the ESG framework, through many of the other frameworks, all we are seeing is money going in, but we are not seeing the impact on the ground. And one of the areas that we, um, along with our partners, have um, really managed to put the push the frontier on is recognizing the extent to which we are able to improve and quantify the extent to which we are able to improve the resilience of the people that we are working with. So we've been able to quantify that for, you know, the amount of investment that we've cu currently got on so eight and a half billion dollars that is currently under investment. But in the previous replenishment, we, we had seven, approximately seven and a half billion. And we were able to show that, yes, we were able to improve the resilience of people that we are targeting by more than 20 percent. And we were able to show where where we were not able to do this and for what reason. And I think that honest and brutal look at how we are designing our investments is really key if we want to build this platform with the private sector, where, as Chris said as well, we've got to bring in the producers as really a key part. And Maria Elena actually has quoted the DSG in saying this. Um, we've got to bring in the producers as a key part of the overall value chain that we are looking at. So I think my focus would be, yes, it's important to look at the private sector, 
We've got to look at innovation in that context. We've got to build a pipeline, but it's really important to understand what the quality of that interaction is. And I think here, international and public agencies have a very deep responsibility. And third, we've got to build the evidence in the data. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, private sector, uh, equity, but also evidence and impact on the ground. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a very good uh, transition to the next question. Um, I think we, <clears throat> we witnessed the launch of the Global uh, Biodiversity Framework Fund at the Jeff Assembly. And this is a fund uh, that will be housed at the Jeff uh, with the goal to protect the global ecosystems and, and species. So um, it, was, uh, it was the launch and there was a uh, uh, lot of ex 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 excitement uh, during that, that, that time. Um, I just want you to reflect a little bit since you talked about this, and I will go back to you, Joe, because you, you highlighted that as one of the key highlights when you spoke about the, the highlights of the assembly. Um, you know, if you can just speak a little bit about the launch of that fund and what that means really uh, in the work that we're doing, either in the ecosystem uh, protection, but also in the area of uh, food system, because you already uh, put that. So very quickly, if you can give us a bit of your thoughts on that. Thanks, Peter. So I, I think the key thing is recognizing that the fund is a that the biodiversity framework fund is a really important step in the right direction. We started to at IFAD, we started to re recognize the importance of biodiversity when we set a target for ourselves that 30% of all of our climate finance um, investments had to be nature-based and or biodiversity-based, and that's by 2030. I think first setting a target institutionally is really key because that provides us with the incentives to essentially build that portfolio. But I think secondly, also recognizing that this is not the end game. Really, what we've got to build is the pipeline of those projects or those investments that are that can really absorb this kind of these kind of resources and for that we need technical capacity we need technical advice we need to work through uh, the national food systems transition uh, transformation pathways and we need to ensure that we've got the ability to see as to what the impact of these resources are going to be on the ground and there i think we are still a little bit far away so when we are thinking about resilience, where we are thinking about meets, mean species abundance, for example, as an indicator, we've got to think of a lot more uh, in the context of international organizations to see what is going to be the impact of the overall biodiversity fund on actions on the ground and the resilience of the peoples that we are serving. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And let me go back to Chris. Um, I guess uh, when we launched the, this uh, the, the one day, the um, GBFF was uh, actually approved uh, in in, uh, in in Montreal. Uh, there is a provision that also bank and development bank should be really participating in these funds as well. Um, and for you to witness the launch of this at the uh, the assembly uh, with the first pledge uh, that came from actually the government of Canada, two hundred million. Uh, Canadian US dollar and also we had the UK and very recently the German government put on uh, some money as well. So uh, Chris, uh, when you do that, when you see that, um, you know, what do you see and connecting with what the World Bank is doing uh, and what that means really in, uh, in this agenda of uh, ecosystem uh, protections, but also in this agenda of agri-foods. Agri Over to you, Chris. Well, I mean, firstly, you know, um, we're very, very grateful that Jeff has, has taken that initiative and, and raised the money for that fund. Um, when you look at the fund, I mean, you're talking about blended finance, you're talking about technical capacity, matching grant systems. I think these are all very, very important. I mean, just to sort of explain at the moment, you know, where I sit in the World Bank, I'm in the agriculture and food global practice. Our lending portfolio to the public sector is uh, currently standing at $28 billion dollars. Uh, across you know, a whole range of governments to low middle income. The average loan that we are now doing um, you know, to countries you know, related to food systems, related to value chains and so on, is probably now moving to about $250 million. It was 150, so there's a scaling up there. But out of the 28 billion, when we analyze the, the, this portfolio, 45% of that portfolio is actually going to small 
uh, smallholder SME development at the value chain level looking at how to support agricultural productivity, investment in agro-logistics, investments in systems to link and integrate to markets, but also looking at climate change, climate adaption, and so on. And I, I think this fund, you know, as it builds and as it develops and you develop them, you know, you, we, we see the methodology of how this fund will actually operate. I think linking with the World Bank and linking with our portfolio as a fantastic opportunity to leverage considerable more finance into the critical spaces of the biodiversity. I also see, you know, we're talking about Jeff Seven at the moment, which is still running. We've got Jeff Eight coming up. And uh, with the work that I know that, you know, obviously IFAD and, and FAO are leading on that work, but in a lot of that planning, we can start seeing that, you know, the sustainable agriculture, sustainable livestock, sustainable aquaculture, there's gonna be a lot of areas around there around biodiversity, uh, ocean protection, which is part of this framework as well. So there's gonna be huge opportunities uh, yes. to collaborate. And also just sort of the final point to say is that the funding mechanism is gonna be different. It's not gonna be the typical Jeff model. So it creates more opportunities for organizations, CSOs and, and so on, to be able to connect to the Jeff. So I think it's gonna be a great innovation and we're looking forward to seeing how we can collaborate with you further, Peter. Thank you. Fantastic. This creates an opportunity um, to uh, leverage what we've already been doing, actually. Okay. And since this fund will have a little bit of another modality in terms of uh, uh, deployment, uh, that provides quite uh, so many um, good avenues uh, for um, transformation and leveraging um, resources that we have. Uh, Maria, let me go back to you. I know FAO has a big agenda. Um, and um, seeing the Global Biodiversity uh, Framework Fund being launched and receiving all of these pledges. And now we want to open this to private sector. We want to open this to uh, uh, foundations and so on. Um, what is your take when you see this um, linking to uh, your own uh, area of work within FAO? Uh, for FAO, we really welcome the launch of the fund. I think it was an important step and uh, very timely that we approve the global biodiversity framework. And some months later, we are able to, to approve the, the fund that will contribute to the implementation of the GBF. I think it's an important moment. And as it has been said, it will be an instrument to leverage other funds, to bring private sector, uh, and to have innovative ways to bring and to increase the fund. I think it's important. Maybe two comments before I, I move to, to FAO. Uh, we have the experience of other funds, and we hope that the fund will be funded. Sorry for the, that we have enough funds that will be able to bring this transformation we are mentioned that we are able to go at scale and it's a fund that uh, the requirements will be uh, will be able that the small countries that the developing countries will be able to access to the funds that say that the requirements will be smart and will be not uh, and agile in a way that the decision taken will be not uh, so much cumbersome. To me, it's important. You remember when we were uh, in uh, discussing about the fund, several countries, they said for us, the developing countries, we need a fund that can fulfill our needs and our requirements and will be agile in the decision taking. And we hope this will be really what the fund, the fund will bring to, to all of us. Uh, in FAO, you know, in 2019, we approved our strategy, we call mainstreaming biodiversity across agriculture sectors, where we had already started with this integrated approach and the importance of biodiversity to end hunger and to have healthy and diverse food. To achieve our main goal, to have Bio, to preserve and conserve and sustainable use of biodiversity is very important for us. And we look at the biodiversity, as it has been mentioned, to have healthy ecosystem, could be terrestrial ecosystem, could be aquatic ecosystem, and to link to the 
the agriculture sector, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, all the sector, as, as we mentioned. Maybe another point for FAO, it's important when we look at the biodiversity, we talk about the 30%, but we need to look up on the 100%. We conserve 30%, but we need to manage the 70% to be able to sustainable feed the planet, feed the world, and to have a living planet. That is also an important for us. Uh, and maybe that this biodiversity framework and the fund will be able, as Joe and Chris said, to bring innovate, innovation, to bring science, and to bring data, because we need innovative solution that can solve the problems we are facing and can at the same time keep our biodiversity alive and preserved. And this is also important for us. And data and innovation that will be able to manage the implementation and to measure success. Those are also important elements for us in FAO. And having an integrating, connecting the dots, and that financing will be consequent in terms of amount and agility, and to be inclusive to all. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think we had quite a very good discussion, uh, discussion and thank you for sharing your takeaways, sharing uh, some of the ideas, and we really, we really, really appreciate uh, you coming in this. So we are just, uh, we are, I'm, I'm very uh, recognizant of the time and we are pretty much trying to wrap up. Um, and before we do that, I want to give you an opportunity, at least for uh, 30 seconds or 45 seconds or a minute to just give your, um, your final remarks. And let me start with you, Maria. Okay, my final, final remark is, this is a global agenda. We need all of us, we need the efforts of everyone to make it happen and to make it successful. Let's continue working together. Fantastic. Cooperation, coordination and leadership. Fantastic. Let's work together, coordination and leadership. Joe. Your final Thank you, remark. Peter. And unfortunately, I'll leave after this, but just want to say, I think for me, this is that moment of reckoning. We are on our path to get additional financing for a very important resource for the planet. But unless we ensure that the quality of this financing is exactly commensurate with the values that we all hold, including equity and including responsibility to our planet, we will go down a very different pathway than what we anticipate now. So quality along with quantity. Thank you. Quality along with uh, quality. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, your final remarks. My final works, I'm going to spin it a little bit and say that, you know, to the audience, you've heard a lot about agricultural production, food systems transformation. You're hearing what FAO, IFAD and the World Bank are doing and Jeff in this space. My point is, what are you doing in this space as consumers? We're all consumers. So as consumers, play your part as well within the food systems dialogue and the food system consumption space. Thank you, Peter. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, actually, we, we learned quite a lot. And, uh, you know, I don't know how I will summarize this, but I know we, we, we are all trying to work together. We want inclusive process. We want to shape policies. We want innovation. We want additional finance, but also taking into consideration uh, farmers, the ones that are producing our food for us really to move forward and transform our food systems. So thank you all for joining us and sharing this uh, very good insight. Um, I also want to thank the audience who have joined us in this discussion and also thank the uh, GLF that organized uh, this uh, platform for us to share this insight. Um, and I think to coming to an end, um, I would like to wish everyone um, very uh, great day and good evening, a good night for those uh, in Asia and in different places. And thank you again for joining us. Our event has, en has ended. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, GLF. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carly. Yep.